Thanks ever so much for joining us this morning. So this is the latest in our, our mental wellness series, which is brought to you by the Department of Experimental Psychology here at the University of Oxford. Uh, my name is Cathy Creswell, and I'm really pleased to um, introduce you to Professor Paul Shakovskis today, who's Professor of Clinical Psychology in the Department of Experimental Psychology, but also Director of the Oxford Centre for Psychological Health and the Oxford Institute of Clinical Psychology Training and Research and the Oxford Cognitive Therapy Centre, and also course director for the Clinical Psychology Doctorate course here, and clinical director for the Oxford Health Specialist Psychological Interventions Clinic. So as you can hear, he brings a wealth of research and clinical experience, particularly in the understanding and treatment of anxiety disorders, and more specifically OCD, panic and agoraphobia, and health anxiety. So we're really looking forward to this talk today. Before we get started, just a reminder to have a look at our Department of Experimental Psychology website and our YouTube channel, where you'll be able to find all the previous talks in this series. We've had a number of really fantastic talks now on a range of topics, including coping with trauma, bereavement, eating problems, depression and low mood, sleep problems, stress and anxiety. And the next session will be on the 5th of May with Dr. Hannah Murray, who will be talking about understanding and managing troubling mental images. So please do um, keep following the um, YouTube channel or looking at our website for all of that content. And Paul's talk will be on there after today as well, if you want to look back or to share with anybody that you know. Just a reminder that we'll finish at 10.45 and we really encourage you to take a bit of a break after the session. Sometimes these sessions do um, you know, raise challenging thoughts and feelings for us. So really important not to just rush into the next thing, but give yourself a moment, um, have a cup of tea, go for a walk, whatever works for you before you start the next part of your day. Um, and also we will remind you later on, but you'll receive um, a feedback form and we'd be really grateful if you could complete that just to help us uh, really make the most of these sessions. But so without further ado, though, I'll now pass over to Paul, who's going to be talking to us about obsessive compulsive disorder, too careful, too nice and trying too hard. Thanks very much for joining us, Paul. Thank you, Cathy. And having heard your introduction, I now realise why nobody can ever accuse me of being a man with no direction. Um, OK, so um, my my talk to me about OCD. I, I, the, I have a sort of subtitle, which is really just a variation on the same theme. Uh, which is why it can hurt when you're too nice so that you try too hard to be too careful. So I'll try and unfold that uh, over the next half hour. I'll, I'll tell you what OCD is. I'm going to tell you that it is a bit more than I'm a little bit OCD, quite a lot more than that. I'm going to talk about the sad fact that in OCD, typically it's too little, too late. So there is an, there's an important need for early recognition and early help for people with OCD. I'm going to try and explain how being too nice works and how psychological theory helps us understand who it is who suffers from OCD. Um, trying too hard and how the solution becomes the problem. And, and this is sort of good news because um, if it's about trying too hard, then possibly one of the ways forward for people with this problem is to not try as hard, but that's difficult. I'm going to talk about the checking trap, which is uh, why being too careful um, can cause problems. Briefly touch on psychological treatment um, and my view that OCD is an unnecessary illness, that no one should suffer from it, um, but many do because of the unavailability of treatments. And then very briefly, if CBT, cognitive behavior therapy is the answer, I'm going to try and tell you what's in the box. So. OCD, in terms of the diagnosis um, that, that's offered, um, then is intrusive thoughts, images and impulses. It's obsessions and compulsions. It says or in the diagnostic uh, criteria, but it's always and. Compulsions are meaningfully related to the fears. And this is very important because it says essentially that this is a, a culturally uh, determined problem to a degree, that the meaning that people attach to their fears uh, relates to their background and values. By definition, the person seeks to ignore or suppress intrusions. And as I think many of you will know already, the attempt to get rid of a thought essentially has the effect of making it worse. But the key to the diagnosis, and I'm going to emphasize this again in a moment, 
um, is not that these things occur, um, but it's the extent to which it produces severe distress that becomes disabling. Types of OCD include washing, checking, rumination, doubting, scrupulosity, uh, mental contamination, and so on. Not OCD, and recently separated from it, um, is hoarding. I'm not going to talk about hoarding today, but it's a not entirely unrelated problem. So that's kind of the diagnostic version. What it really is, in terms of phenomenology, is obsessions. So I'm unpacking OCD, obsessions, a recurrent thought, image, impulse or doubt, which tells the person that there's a potential for some kind of harm. But even more importantly than the idea of harm, which would make you anxious, is the idea that you can either cause or prevent it, the idea of responsibility, which drives the compulsion. So the compulsion refers to some sort of action, reaction, that's intended to do two things, to prevent the harm that you're worried about because of the obsession, um, but also to diminish responsibility for its occurrence. Both of those things should be familiar um, because everybody gets intrusions. So, you know, very, very long time ago, um, Jack Rachman, um, sadly, we, we lost Jack last year, um, but Jack was, is one of the big movers and shakes in this field. He, he and Padma de Silva, um, myself and Jim Harrison later demonstrated something about intrusions in people with and without OCD. And in particular, pretty much everyone has intrusive thoughts, images, impulses. So it turns out that it's not confined to OCD. If you make a list of the intrusive thoughts that people experience um, and then ask experts to say, well, which of these are from people who have OCD, who've got the disorder, and which of these are from people who don't? Well, they can't. Um, there is absolutely no difference in terms of what people worry about. Um, Christine Purden and David A. Clark, um, this is from a list that they, they produced looking at um, uh, people who don't have OCD and don't have any mental health problems. And these are the percentage of people who experience thoughts like, so 64% of women have intrusive thoughts about running a car off the road, 56% of men, uh, jumping off a high place, 39% of women, 46% of men, and so on. And you'll see that the pattern of intrusions that we see in OCD are pretty much across the piece. Everyone is getting these. So that's a bit of a puzzle. Does this mean we're all a little bit OCD? Well, as my friends and colleagues at OCD UK say, no, this is a myth. Um, OCD is not an adjective. The D in OCD stands for disorder. And this is about suffering. This is about people being damaged. So the fact that somebody wants to arrange things in their fridge in a particular way, uh, and that's a bit quirky, does not mean they have OCD and we should not be describing it in that way because it devalues essentially the, 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 the terrible things that are happening to other people. So let's go back to what it really is and be more complete. It's a, OCD is a disorder, OC, the D is for disorder, and together obsessions and compulsions make the person feel awful, scared, disgusted with themselves typically, um, and stop the person from doing things which matter to them. OCD destroys lives and for many is a living hell. It's not a little quirk to boast about on your social media. This is work um, like Stobie and I did, and, and we, we looked at people who were currently affected by OCD very severely. So this is a group of people who, who really, really struggled to get help. And we just asked them to look back over time. There's, the, 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 the different colours are just two different groups of people, either 57 people or 139. And the first signs of OCD for these people on average was occurring around 15 or 16. Significant interference occurring at the age of 20, which means, of course, half of people are developing it before 20 and half of people later. But here's the interesting thing. From the point at which they essentially had the disorder to the point where they started to seek help, six years go by. And then two more years go by before they're correctly diagnosed. And then treatment of any kind occurring later. Now, why is that important? Well, that's important because um, if, if, I, if I invite the people on this um, webinar to think about what they did between the age of 20 and 28, 
And if that wasn't able to happen because of, because of some sort of mental health problem, how would their life be different now? And much of what we see in severe OCD is not actually the direct effect of OCD, um, you know, it's like the experience of OCD, but as a thing that I sometimes call collateral damage, the, the destruction of relationships and education and, and just life in general. And this is why we should be helping people to detect their OCD earlier and, 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 and then get it treated more quickly. And we'll talk a little bit about why that doesn't happen in a moment. So let's talk about this thing uh, about being too nice. So is it really true that people with OCD are too nice? Well, yes, I think it is. OCD happens to people who are too nice for their own good. There are, in fact, lessons from history. An evolution of the focus of OCD, what OCD is about, uh, changes over time. It, and it's typically OCD focuses on the invisible spiritual, moral or physical menace, whether that's as it is at the moment, COVID-19 or HIV, or in the 50s and 60s, radiation. But going much further back, you know, we're looking at people who experienced, um, experienced religious obsessions, who had blasphemous thoughts and so on. And of course, very famously, um, a couple of figures from history, there are many more, but Martin Luther, um, I'm talking about Martin Luther the monk in Germany, uh, and John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, you know, very famously, are describing um, essentially obsessional ruminations um, and the fact that we don't see so much religious OCD at the moment in this country but we do in some other cultures is very informative in my view. So who gets what? What type of OCD? And, and I, I'm just going to summarise it by saying for example that loving parents develop OCD around harming their children, clean people develop OCD about being contaminated, or contaminating others. Deeply religious people develop OCD around blasphemy. Gentle people develop OCD around being violent. Now you should be spotting the pattern because we can, uh, oh, sorry, people who are risk averse develop OCD around being careless. The pattern is this, that loving parents worry about harming their children. So when they have these intrusive thoughts, it doesn't mean they're going to harm their children. It means that is the worst thing that could happen. And so they, they worry about that as we all worry about the thing, the worst thing that would happen to us. Clean people worry about being contaminated and contaminating others. Deeply religious people worry about blaspheming. Gentle people worry about being violent. People who are risk averse worry about being careless. So essentially, OCD is the opposite of who you are, opposite of the values uh, that you espouse. And that's really important. That takes us to um, the cognitive theory of OCD. And at its simplest, um, the, the cognitive theory says, unacceptable intrusive thoughts, images, impulses, doubts occur in everybody. Intrusions that we notice are the ones that we think are important for us. Interestingly, that's positive or negative, but we're focusing here in OCD on the negatives. Um, intrusions can include day-to-day -day stuff, good ideas, and unpleasant and unacceptable ideas. When unacceptable intrusions occur, um, the person with OCD fears and believes they might be responsible for harm if they don't react to prevent or undo it. And they respond by trying too hard. OCD is fundamentally a matter of the person who's beset by frightening thoughts, trying to get rid of them and therefore ex experiencing them more. People trying to prevent harm and becoming less and less certain that they are able to do that, trying to, sure, to be too sure and so on. And what happens is the solution becomes the problem. So in OCD, the person who's worried about contamination, contamination OCD, if you want to call it, well, contamination is not their problem. It's, it's the, the washing and the attempts to avoid being contaminated that, that's the problem. And we'll talk about a more extreme version in a moment. So trying too hard is not a solution in OCD. And I'm just gonna summarize this by saying no one in the history of, oops, no one in the history of time has ever got rid of OCD by giving into it, by doing better rituals or more rituals or getting better at avoidance. No one ever. But OCD is a liar and it fools people into thinking that if they could just get the perfect wash, then they would be better. That's because it'd be like digging to get out of a hole. And, you know, you could say, well, I need a better spade to get out of this hole. We need to dig for longer, need to dig more efficiently. Uh, 
what happens if you constantly redouble your efforts? So here's what happens. So here's how it starts. Okay, so you know, you've got a perfectly reasonable thing. You wash your hands after you go to the bathroom or you check the door before you leave, and it's all very functional. But if you keep digging, yeah, then of course that gets a lot worse. And then if you really, really try to keep digging, then this is how it's going. And this is unfortunately what happens if you try to get rid of OCD by giving into it uh, and so on. Now that's, it's, it's not just a matter of not giving into it, it's a really hard thing to do. So too careful, let's just talk about being too careful and the cruel truth about OCD. OCD is a con man. Um, it promises safety and comfort and steals the person's life. I saw yesterday somebody said, um, that, that OCD drives everything out of your life until only it is there. And in most ex the most extreme cases, I think that's right. OCD warns you to be careful in a way which distracts you from the real risks. Um, so risk in OCD is often misunderstood. I sadly heard recently um, about somebody, this is a quite common thing. This was somebody who was uh, working in a, a, as, as a teacher um, and a mental health professional misunderstood their OCD and then essentially alerted the authorities to the fact that they had thoughts about harming children. And as a result, that person essentially was barred from their job, I hope temporarily, um, and, and, and essentially they were seen as a risk. Now, bottom line on this is that people with OCD who have, who, who have thoughts of harming people, they are the least harmful people in the entire universe. So there's the, the question of risk in OCD is a complicated one, uh, but it also is very simple in the sense there's, that I would say, no, there is no primary risk. If someone with OCD is afraid that they're gonna harm somebody or something, then they're not gonna do that. But there is this thing called secondary risk. So let me explain secondary risks um, uh, in this way. This is a very sad news story. <coughs> um, this is a man in Manchester, and the coroner basically, after he died, basically said that he died of an overdose of Dettol, that this is somebody who had, had cleaned so much that he absorbed this disinfectant it, it, through, his, through his skin, and as a result had died. And that's secondary risk. The secondary risk in OCD is not that the things you're afraid of will happen, but it's the, th the way you try to prevent these things um, have the effect of, prevent, of, of, of causing a different harm. So the loving mother who's afraid of harming her child may not be able to cuddle the child um, in the way that the child and she need. And as a result, and not be able to put the child on the floor, then potentially some damage can happen. That damage is not happening because of the OCD, but it's happening because of the lack of treatment. Now, in this piece on this poor man who died of Dettol poisoning, his sister said at the bottom of the slide, he didn't want any help and was scared of receiving it. And that's because he, he was afraid of doing so. And this, in my view, is the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room in OCD um, is that it's so poorly understood that people think that if someone has a thought of being a paedophile, um, or of causing harm, that that means that they are a risk, which of course they're not. And the elephant in the room is stigma. What an elephant is, what this particular elephant is composed of um, is essentially avoidance, reluctance, denial, ignorance, diversion, silence, awkwardness. I don't quite know where the trunk fits in, but we'll leave that uh, and so on. So. One of the things that I, my, my lifelong aim and the aim of the charities I work with, particularly OCD UK, um, uh, is to try to remove the stigma. So let's try and get a bit of a better understanding of what's going on in OCD. Let's briefly talk about the checking trap. Now, you would think, wouldn't you, that if you were struggling to remember something that, you know, and, and if it was very, very important, and of course, by definition, people with OCD feel that checking their door is very important because if they don't get burgled or whatever, you think that checking would be helpful because if you check, you're going to be more sure. But here's the thing. Um, when you try by repeatedly checking to com be completely and perfectly sure, 
as demonstrated by psychologist Marcel von der Haut, by Adam Radomski and others, what happens um, is that repeated checking removes your confidence in your memory. Anybody, whether they have OCD or not, if you go past six or seven checks, as you've checked the door, is it locked, or check the iron, is it still on, uh, and so on, you become less and less confident in whether or not the kind of end point um, was safe or not. So repeated checking undermines confidence in memory. You and I, if we don't have OCD, typically are not checking, uh, are not checking more than a couple of times. People with OCD, because they think it's so important to be completely certain and perfectly sure, check loads of times and they get further and further away from the idea that, um, that, that they're safe. Um, their memory gets worse and worse, their confidence in memory deteriorates. So those who check don't have problems remembering, but they do try too hard. Um, they use problematic stop criteria. Another piece of research Karina Wall and myself did, um, and the repeated checking of the type prominent in OCD progressively undermines your confidence, which makes you want to check more. And there is one of several vicious circles which we've identified in OCD. Just to, as a note here, there's a type of checking which isn't as obvious, but it's still checking, and that's seeking reassurance. Asking your loved one, are my hands clean? Do, are you sure, or are you sure the door is locked and so on? Now that's actually checking with an extra element. Um, and what our research, Brynja Halderson in particular, Azama Kabori and I picked up, that what's happening there is that when you seek reassurance, you're checking and you're also transferring responsibility. So the idea of responsibility there, so that you make the other person responsible for the harm. And that seems to make it easier in the short term, but has the effect of undermining your confidence, both in that particular occasion and in general in your ability to be sure. So, okay, that's broadly speaking, the way we psychologically understand it. So if what I'm saying is true, shouldn't we just, just stop it? So we should say to a person with OCD, Stop it. It's a bit like saying a person with anorexia will eat more, um, or the person who's depressed say, cheer up. Okay, so people with OCD can't just stop it. It's just not that easy. What's needed is appropriate support. Um, OCD is not an accident, and this is a, an important starting point. Uh, it's about who you are, the values you have, um, but not typically in the way you think. The, the, the person who's troubled by a blasphemous thoughts is, of course, you know, the person who's got their collar on the wrong way around, um, the person who, the, the minister of religion or the imam uh, or, or whatever. So what the person with OCD needs to understand is why is their problem so severe? And again, the psychological formulation helps us understand that. But even more importantly, why does it persist? And as with almost all of the problems we deal with in mental health, it's not necessarily a problem that people feel anxious or that they have intrusions, and so on, but why are these severely severe and persistent and how can they change the things which which um uh, actually are making it severe and persistent sometimes it's helpful to know why it starts but typically it's not actually where you would start in treatment so what treatment does treatment cognitive behavior therapy um it all follows roughly the same pattern in ocd and everywhere else but it has unique features and in general, what we do in psychological treatments is help people see things differently so they can do things differently. That's about perspective, but more importantly also, they're using that perspective to experiment. What do I mean? Well, I mean that people suffer from anxiety problems such as OCD because they think the situation they're in is more dangerous than it really is. Um, and they get stuck in this way of seeing the world and they get caught in these loops. Uh, I've given you the checking trap as an example of that. Um, Effective change, the way being helped, needs the person to be able to be more flexible in the way they see things. And that's a really crucial thing. It's about actually being more flexible. This means finding and considering or an alternative, less negative way of understanding that problem. So the person who says to me, Paul, I think I'm a paedophile, I'm going to say, well, I understand why uh, you're afraid of that. But is it possible that you're actually a person who's terrified of being a paedophile. It's not that you are a paedophile, it's that it's the fear of being a paedophile that's the problem. For a different way um, of thinking to be helpful, 
um, it has to fit with the person's past experience. It has to make sense. Um, and, and it's really, really important that people feel understood. Um, and as a therapist, it's really important that I don't just help them feel understood, but I do that by understanding. It also, it's not enough just to get an understanding so-called insight, but it's also important that you can then test it out. So good therapy is actually about at least two people, myself and, 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 and the person who's suffering, working together, and that working together is important to find out how the world really works. And good therapy is always about two experts working on the problem in close collaboration. Me, as somebody who knows a little bit about OCD, um, but not necessarily a great deal about the person's life. And that person who knows everything is a super expert in their own life. And by the way, a bit of an expert in OCD too. So in terms of how people should approach um, CBT, it's important to understand that therapists, CBT therapists, people like myself, do not change people. People choose to change themselves. So CBT in the end is self-help with someone helping you to understand and apply that understanding. You need to go to therapy if that's where you're headed. I'm expecting to be helped to understand the nature of the problem and help to choose to change. You should go to therapy and really importantly, we're pretty useless therapists until you help us. So you've got to go to therapy expecting that a therapist is going to need a lot of help from you. So here's what I say is in the box uh, when I open it for CBT. And, and what you should expect to see, this is your user's manual for a CBT, some time to understand you as well as your problem. A good therapist first gets to know you before they get to know your problem. Discussion of how best to deal with questions in, in therapy itself. And essentially, I would typically start therapy by saying, well, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. But before we do that, do you have any questions for me? And encouraging people to, to ask questions and to be, participate actively in treatment as we go through. And then it's about allowing the person to share their story, uh, agreeing on what it is you're going to work on. Um, I would want to do a general assessment and find out you know, what's happening for this person in general, but then a specific assessment leading to the thing we call formulation, which is a shared understanding, working through some combination of helping people to change the way they think, but also the thing we call behavioral experiments, which is don't trust me, but find out for yourself helping the person confront their fears, helping them to generalize changes, and then really importantly, working on how to reclaim their life. That is the only show in town uh, as far as psychological treatment of OCD is concerned. To find out more, I've already recommended um, OCD UK. OCD UK, they also um, they, they make available a number of books I've put two that I've been involved in. Uh, other books are available. Um, and I'm just going to mention at the end here that we always need help with, with our research. Um, and that's, that's our website at the bottom. And if anybody wants to volunteer, either if they've got problems or they haven't got problems, um, we're always very keen um, to, to, to have that. So hopefully I've helped you understand um, that OCD is not as weird as you think. And that really this is a problem of people who are too nice, too careful and trying too hard. Thank you very much. Thanks very much indeed, Paul. I'm sure that was extremely useful information for people. And thanks very much also for sharing those resources as well. Um, as you know, we had various questions submitted. So, um, and many of those you've touched on already, but um, we've got a chance to delve into them a bit further now. I mean, you've obviously spoken a lot about OCD, what it is, what it isn't, and the public perception of that and the importance of overcoming the stigma and the barriers that people face in being able to access, seek help and then access it. So, I mean, what do you think are the key things that need to be done to improve public understanding of OCD? Because as you said, it is often so misrepresented. Well, we can stop the misrepresentation. I mean, I got into a bit of a battle with Channel 4 when they, they, they ran a programme called um, Obsessive Compulsive <coughs> Cleaners which was horrible, which was horrific, which kind of paired up people who were struggling with cleanliness and people with hoarding and so on, with people who had very severe um, sort of cleaning rituals, some of whom did, some of whom didn't. And it very much kind of portrayed it as sort of, let's point and laugh at the, at the dirty people and then, then marvel at people, you know, 
pouring bleach over themselves and other people and, and so on. And that that was at a time when Channel 4 had signed the mental health pledge that they were going to destigmatize. And they completely ignored the representations of multiple organizations and so on. So, so our media needs to get its act together and it needs to stop misunderstanding this. We need to stop being in the position. I mean, it's deeply frightening for, I mean, I mentioned, you know, the young man who's a teacher and who's being stopped from being a teacher um, because he was honest enough to talk to a mental health professional about the problems he was experiencing, which did not increase his risk. And he's facing uh, this horrific battle and, and just, you know, so, so we, we, need to, we need to get out there that it's not just a funny little quirk, that it's not all about washing hands, although washing hands is a very serious problem for those who have it. And we need to we need to be having more sessions like this, um, and we need to have better understanding um, all around. So yeah, it's being more open, making making giving people better access to treatment, not putting hurdles in the way, not giving them, as sometimes happens, meaningless treatments um, before they're able to get through to more specialist or focused treatments. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, within that, you were talking about hand washing, obviously contamination fears of, of one of the, I guess, probably the more well-known aspects of OCD. To, to what extent do the strategies that you've described here apply to contamination fears? And is there any sort of particular advice you'd give for that context? Oh, entirely. I mean, and of course, it's very relevant at the moment with COVID. I mean, one of the things that happened early on with lockdown, people were using hand gel, um, self-isolating and so on. And, and for some people with contamination OCD, that, that gave them a bit of a, a bit of a break, a bit of a holiday. Um, but that was kind of a false thing in the sense that it just meant that they were able to avoid more um, as opposed to having to deal with everyday things. And now we're coming out of lockdown. Of course, it's worse because we've had sort of socially sanctioned um, sort of avoidance and, and checking. So contamination fears were, are, are particularly easy to treat with an OCD, with one exception, which I'll briefly mention in a moment. Um, the, and, um, and, and, and essentially, you know, because there's a kind of physical, there's a physical thing that you can confront, as with any other sort of more sort of phobic type pattern, um, people can confront the, this thing and can be supported with that. The, the self-help book, Break Free from OCD, talks a great deal about what you can do with that and other things and so on. So people can do a great deal of that themselves. And yes, CBT works particularly well there. The exception I mentioned is this thing called mental contamination. And this seems to relate to, and this is something that came out very recently, again, by Jack Rachman, uh, was the person who generated this, this insight that some people don't feel contaminated by what they touch, but contaminated by what's going on in their mind. And often that relates to traumatic events. Bullying seems to be, and I know you've had a previous one, bully, bullying seems to do this, that people feel dirty inside and try to deal with it by washing. So probably sort of Lady Macbeth or Pontius Pilate style, you know, that, 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 that you've that, that these, these, these horrible feelings and washing is, a, is used as a way to get rid of it. Now, exposure to contaminants, don't help there. And so you actually need a quite different strategy that involves dealing with the, the memories that people have of these things. Okay, thanks very much. And yeah, it's useful to know that the book there will be particularly useful in that situation. Um, I suppose one of the other things that people often link with OCD is perfectionism. So can you say a bit about um, that, the association between OCD and perfectionism and how they may or may not be linked? Perfectionism, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because it's a double-edged sword. Kathy, I'm going to accuse you of being a bit of a perfectionist in some areas. Um, and I don't think you can really deny it, except that it's in particular areas. And that's the issue, isn't it? So the, the problem in perfectionism is defined typically as having unrelentingly high standards, but really across the piece, not just in terms of the research you do, but also in terms of how clean your shoes are and, and, and how tidy your office is, which I'm going to plead guilty to not being a perfectionist about. And so perfectionism, like unrelenting high standards across the piece and being really worried about mistakes in how tidy your room is in the same way as in your data. Uh, and again, I'm going to accuse you of being a perfectionist to make sure your data is correct. Uh, and correctly dealt with. So persistence is helpful, perfectionism, clinical perfectionism is not. There's an interesting wrinkle that, that, that a piece of research that Claire Lomax uh, and um, uh, myself and others did, um, we, where, where essentially we looked at people with what's called obsessive compulsive personality disorder, um, which is not OCD, 
Um, and we looked at people who had both OCD and OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And the people who had both problems did better than the people who only had OCD. And we worked out, and we're pretty sure, that this is because their perfectionism clicked in in their treatment. And so they did the treatment very thoroughly. And so perfectionism is an advantage, but not when it overgeneralizes. So it can impact on OCD, um, um, but it's a double-edged sword, as, as I've already indicated. Thank you. I mean, you, you were very clear that obviously OCD, the D stands for disorder. So we're talking about people who are experiencing high levels of distress and interference in their lives. Um, however, obviously, many of the symptoms you've described and are are things that different people will experience to different degrees. And obviously, as you said, many of the intrusive thoughts are things that are extremely common for us all. So at what point should people be worried about these symptoms? And at what point would you encourage people to seek help? OK, um, <clears throat> you've sort of answered it in your question, haven't you? But, but, but I mean, it, it's, when it, when, it's when it interferes. It's when it begins to interfere or when it starts to make you feel horrible. And, and, and I think there's a really simple, in, in a sense, in terms of what we can do about this. I think we need to be working in schools or, and working in, in, in universities and so on, help people to understand that if something happens and they start to find they're being disturbed by intrusions and then they're having to change their pattern of things to do, then they need to confront these things. And that, that I'd call that kind of secondary prevention, that you're starting to get, you're starting to get some signs of this. And so you go ahead, so you're worried about washing your hands um, too much so you stop washing your hands for a day um, and, 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 and sort of you know, try and nip it in the bud. Um, so it's about when it starts to interfere, then fight back rather than digging to get out the hole, you know, and ending up in, as, the, as the, the, that digger in that amazing picture. Um, so, so I kind of think it, it, it's, it's beginning to interfere with you, with, with the lives of, of your loved ones. I haven't mentioned loved ones, but OCD is something that's suffered not just by the person, but by their families, uh, as well by the, by the people who love and care for them and so on. And, you know, and, and it starts to interfere, then that's the time to fight back or seek help. Thanks very much. And two things just to pick up, from, up on from uh, what you just said there. First of all, you mentioned schools and we did have some questions about this. Obviously, lots of the examples you've described today are based on adults, but, but obviously recent studies have suggested about half of all people who have OCD will first have it before the age of 19. So can you say a bit more about treatment of children and adolescents and, you know, uh, what the prognosis is and um, and how we might approach treatment differently for young people versus adults? Okay. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, the, the, the graphs that I showed indicate that. So that, that showed an average of 20 in that sample, which means half of the people developed it before. Interestingly, the, the epidemiology suggests something, though, because, about, because the, the number of children with OCD and the number of adults with OCD looks almost identical, which means probably that half of those children had a remission of their problem, probably not necessarily just with treatment, but a remission of the problem. So, so it's not a life sentence when children get it. Children, as you know, Cathy, are respond extremely well to treatment. And, and of course, by, almost by definition, they don't have this big delay. So there's a potential advantage um, to having uh, to, to, to kind of uh, having it occur relatively early because your parents will take you along by the hand and, 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 and get help and so on. I understand there are difficulties in getting specific help and so on, but nevertheless, it comes to light earlier. So that's important. The treatments that we use with the adults generalise extremely well. They need adapting. And again, you and your colleagues, people like um, uh, Polly White um, and, uh, and others, uh, have done a really good job of adapting um, the adult things so that they're developmentally appropriate. But it looks the same. I mean, it's, it's actually surprisingly similar. Um, in this kind of way. And I think we don't necessarily have to wait as long. There's another encouraging thing. Um, Victoria Bream and I did, uh, did a piece of work on people who were, who as adults had OCD, rather like the, 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 uh, the, the stuff we showed at onset. So we looked at them as adults and we divided them into people whose OCD started before the age of 12 or after the age of 16. So these were adults, but, we, but the start of their problem had been very early or relatively later. Um, and then we looked to see how well they did in treatment today, in their, when they're in their 40s and 50s and so on. And what was very encouraging was, in fact, if anything, the people who'd started their problem earlier, 
they had they 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 were more severe at the beginning of the, the treatment that we offered them, but they improved more. Um, and actually they ended up in the same place as the people who started the problem later. So it it even even later in life, I think treatment of children is where is the way to go. But if that doesn't happen, don't get upset because you started your OCD before the age of 12. It turns out you will do very well under those circumstances, which is great news. Okay, that is. Thanks very much. And, and you, the other thing that you mentioned when you were speaking before was about you know, supporting our, our loved ones if they're experiencing OCD. Can you say a bit more about that? You know, what can we do to support those around us yeah. who are struggling with OCD? Well, let's start by not blaming them. And, and one of the, yeah, I've got a big B in my bonnet about about, about um, people being blamed because the, because the, because the, the, their children or their loved ones got OCD because because they gave in to them, you know, they, they, they checked the door for them or they gave them reassurance and so on. And, and I'm afraid as professionals, we do a lot of damage by saying things like, well, if only you'd not given your, your, your child the reassurance, only you'd not adapted, if you only not done these things and so on. The reality is this, that, um, that, that if your child comes to you with, um, uh, with you know, it's, and wants reassurance and they're distressed and so on, you could, in principle, say, I'm not going to reassure you, I'm not going to look at your hands, I'm not going to do these things for you. And under those circumstances, there's going to be a meltdown and it's going to go on for hours. And at the end of it all, you're going to end up giving in because you've got no other choice. Um, and so, you know, what people do is the right thing. They, they, they do what their job is as a mother or a father or partner. Um, and they, they offer love and support to the person by reassuring them, by doing things for them and so on. And that is not... That is not a terrible thing they're doing. That is the only way they can get through the day. Because if they, if they respond by giving reassurance, by, by checking the door uh, or, or checking the hands of the young person or the adult, um, then that lets, helps the person get through the day. Once they move into treatment, then that can shift. But it's not a matter of that person stopping giving reassurance or, or stopping accommodating. It's about the person, the child, um, agreeing to that and then shifting to shifting from, say, reassurance seeking to support. So, so basically, mum you know, can give you know, the child a big cuddle and say, I'm so proud of you for not washing your hands. I'm so proud of you for, for not asking me to check the door. Now let's, let's do something nice instead and so on. So, but but the, the, the reality of this is very often that parents already feel guilty, who already think, well, what could possibly go wrong, feel terrible about it, and then... Uh, yeah, blame themselves and sometimes we kind of add to that which we absolutely shouldn't mm, absolutely agree and, and I, I can see exactly what you said there applies equally not just to, to parent children but to partners to friends to others yeah. as well we can take the same supportive approach thank you we, we are out of time there was one other question that um, we were keen to ask which was about support that might be available for university staff and students but I think what we'll do is follow up with some information to attendees about that um, but thanks ever so much Paul that's been a really fantastic session I hope that everyone who's joined us today has found it uh, as useful and interesting as I have just a reminder of our next session which will be on the 5th of May with Dr Hannah Murray talking about understanding and managing trouble or men troubling mental images so, which obviously is um, very much relates to what we've been talking about here today as well um, and also just a reminder of our YouTube channel, Department of Experimental Psychology at the University of Oxford YouTube channel, which has all of the talks on it and will have Paul's talk on it soon too. So please do look back at that and catch up on any of the sessions you might have missed. Um, so thanks ever so much again for joining us. Thank you very much again, Paul. Please do take a little bit of time now before you go on to the next part of your day. And we hope you can join us again soon. Thanks very much.